we just finished our tutorials and assignments one and two, a fantasy landscape and a fantasy creature. If we go to our unit modules, our next task is to combine those two. So to take our creature concept and to put it into our composited landscape. And this is going to be our first proving ground. We have four proving grounds through the semester. There are like mini assignments that if you do all four of them and get all points for all four of them, they're each worth a point and a half by different rubrics, then you will achieve by the end of the semester your creative problem solving badge. So a creative problem solving badge is something beyond your grade and credit in this course. It is a certification badge that you put onto your, your LinkedIn, to your resume. It's, it's like getting an outside external certification in a certain skill. And these are called the 21st century skills badges. For this class, we are doing creative problem solving. And we have to be able to demonstrate certain talents within that skill. And this badge will follow you wherever you want. You'll be able to always download it and, and have kind of that reference to this. Basically, it's like a certificate of accomplishment. So for creative problem solving, there are four proving grounds through the semester. The first is the most basic. It's just to be able to think thoughtfully about what you're looking at. right? And we're applying it towards artwork here. So it's called identifying patterns. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at our creature. We're going to look at our landscape. We're going to think about how they might be integrated. We're going to think about light source. We're going to think about temperature. We're going to think about environmental factors like the atmosphere and how light's going to filter through it. The next one is going to be about convergent and divergent thinking. And this one's about coming up with, with possible solutions before you settle on a solution. So it's going to be about thumbnailing, and process critiquing logo sketches before you choose your final logo design that's coming up. And then number three is managing ambiguity. This is about a creative critique process where you actually have to deal with unexpected changes to the process and understand how that can make it a more effective product at the end. And then number four is applying an iterative process. And that's what we're going to do for our final project. And that's where you work through a certain system of development and critique to make your end product better. And you're willing to kind of repeat that as needed. So going with proving ground number one, you will see how this relates and how this breaks down. So they're not all that complicated but they are building up towards that overall understanding of creative problem solving writ large. And you can pass the class, but not get the creative problem solving badge if you don't meet all those requirements. And you can fail the class and still get the creative problem solving badge <laughs> if you meet all those requirements, right? So it's kind of an additional benefit of the course. So if we go to unit six, it will talk through what we're trying to do. And so here you see some past student examples of creatures being integrated into their fantasy landscapes. And you'll see the, the vast differences, the variety of landscapes that we have in the class, because you created this landscape without thinking, without any limitations about what you'd be using it for. But there's a little bit more I need you to do for the creative problem solving besides just putting your creature into the landscape. We have to identify certain things about your images. The first thing we need to identify is what your res resolution is. So what your pixel resolution is. And you have to identify whether you have enough pixels for it to be printed at a decent size. And that would be print resolution or whether it's low enough resolution that you can only have it be projected, that it's screen resolution. So screen resolution is 72 pixels per inch. And print resolution is a minimum of 300 pixels per inch. 
And as long as you have something that's eight by 10 or larger, that's considered a, a usable size, right? For either printing or for screen resolution. So we're first gonna identify that. Then I want you to actually think about your creature and the environment and write a little statement about it where you name your creature and you talk about how it lives in this environment, right? Is there something in it that it eats? Is there something that it preys on? Is it is it prey itself? Is there a way it camouflages? Does it come out at, at nighttime? You know, does it uh, have trouble breathing the, the harsh atmosphere? Whatever you wanna say. So in this example, I call my creature the woodland mist gremlin. It thrives in environments rich in moisture and rotting timber. It feasts on the decaying wood of ancient forests converting hard to digest ling lignin into oxygen rich flatulence. I remember I wrote that because I just read a story about lignin and how it's created birds that fly higher. Anyway, science journalism. Okay. Amongst rampant deforestation, these creatures have become a disruptive and haunting presence to logging operations, camouflaging easily within the leafy undergrowth. This leads to the abandonment of sawmills and timber farms whose buildings and equipment provide the creature's most common shelter. So think of the symbiotic relationships between your environment and the creatures. This is really good for, for fantasy world building. My son wants to be a creative writer. He's writing a science fiction story right now. We are just talking in the car this morning on the way to school. He has a desert setting. He's going to have oil rigs in the desert. And he's wondering what kind of like life forms would, would gather towards the oil rigs. And he came up with like these oil beetles that eat raw crude and then their waste product is refined petroleum. And so these are more like pumps into like termite nests of these beetles. He's 15. And so then we're thinking, well, what's going to prey on that? We came up with something called viper wasps. And then we're thinking, you know, so it just builds and builds and builds. And it's just a good way of thinking about your artwork so you can start to identify things. That's going to help you identify the lighting, the atmosphere, and just the, the overall era. So this is a past student example. It was done at a lower resolution because this was when we were remote. So it's only, it's only high enough resolution for screen resolution. And they have to say that so you know the limitations of your image, right? But they say this creature is a free-floating scavenger of the sulfurous gases rich in the atmosphere of its low-gravity environment. So that's why it's floating here. You have a cast shadow underneath. It shelters underneath the canopy of the giant mushroom forest and expels a phosphorescent vapor as a byproduct that contributes to the rainbow-colored skies. So what I like about this one is it even makes a case for why their landscape is so psychedelic looking. That it has this phosphorescent atmosphere and that these creatures actually create byproducts that, that lead to that. So on and on and on. Some other examples. So how do we actually do this? We're going to use all the compositing skills that we've used in the last two projects, right? And it's important to remember that your creature might be totally different than its environment, but this has precedence in our media. So if you think of Space Jam or Mary Poppins, you know, where you're mixing 2D animation with live action, as long as the lighting matches, <laughs> we can believe that Michael Jordan is playing with these monsters, right? So notice lighting, how important direction of lighting is, color, temperature of lighting, cast shadows, and atmosphere. So these are the things you're gonna get points for. The first is to make sense of your data, making sure you accurately identify your resolution and physical format. So I want you to tell me how large this will be and what resolution it will be. And if you do both of those things, you'll get that, that half point. Next, you're going to recognize commonalities among seemingly unrelated situations. So did you place your, your creature onto a landscape background in a way that utilized a common light direction and accommodated for the angle of your creature's anatomy? So not only do you need to make your creature 
fit the lighting, but we're going to learn how to pose your creature so its feet can actually match the terrain. Right. And if your creature is flying or floating or swimming, you know, what what is the lighting doing to its cast shadow? And if you can do that, match the light and the angle of the anatomy correctly in the environment, that's worth half a point. And then novel problems in familiar terms. Did you explain how your creature is intended to interact with its environment in your post, accounting for atmospheric and practical concerns? For example, how does your creature breathe, shelter, and eat in this environment? And if you do that, you'll get that last half point. So the only new skill we're going to learn here is what's called a non-destructive overlay layer, where we're going to dodge and burn shadows onto a separate layer that will then get overlaid onto our landscape. So I'll, I'll be demonstrating that. And this can be a really nice end portfolio piece. It's also important to note that in fitting your creature into your landscape, you might need to crop your landscape, right? You might take a section of your big landscape and crop into it to showcase your creature. And that's why understanding the resolution is so important. So what do we need for this project? We need our first two assignments, and we especially need assignment one. So I have that here. And we need the PSD file for assignment one. So I'm going to open that up. Then from assignment two, you don't need your PSD file. You need your cleanly cut out PNG file which merged it all into one sticker with a transparent background, right? So step one in this course flow is just getting a nice clean cutout of your creature as a PNG. And this one looks pretty good. There's no kind of debris around it. There's things that can definitely be improved on the creature. I never did bleach its teeth. But the edges are pretty clean. There's a little bit of debris there, you can see. So this is a great opportunity to clean up your work. But when you composite it into an environment, that can be a little bit more forgiving than just a blank background. OK, so then what do you do? We first want to move our PNG creature. So into our landscape. So I'm going to go to my top layer that's turned on, select that, and then I'm going to drag my PNG on top. Now, it just so happens that when I do that, it will show me the native resolution of my PNG creature, which is large because it's made to be 8 by 10 by 350, and my landscape is made to be larger than 11 by 14 by 350. So as soon as you do that, you can go to your image size just to note your resolution. So right now, if I can fit my creature into this landscape in a way that's believable, and I don't want your creature to be tiny in the landscape, I want it to take up at least a quarter of the landscape, right? And sometimes, Students choose to do that by making lots of multiples of their creature, but you can also do that by cropping down your landscape. But I don't want it to be a Where's Waldo project where we're trying to find your creature. But if I can make my creature work within this visibly, and I think I can, then I have plenty enough here for print resolution. So right now I'm at 16 by 11 inches by, by 350. If I wanted to meet the exact criteria of the assignment and say, how large would this print in print resolution? What I would do is I would uncheck resample and I would change the resolution to 300, which is standard minimum print resolution. And I would say this prints at 18.9 inches wide, 13.6 inches tall at print resolution of 300 pixels per inch. If I printed it at screen resolution, it would be 78, basically 79 inches by 57 inches. So that's huge for screen resolution. So this is obviously better suited for print resolution. And that's the first step, just identifying your data. Okay, now, how do we blend this in believably? 
And that's what the next video.